All right, welcome everyone uh, to Boulder, Silicon Flatirons and Colorado Law. I asked Nate to put the, the photo back up. Uh, Travis uh, Littman is, uh, uh, Littman, excuse me, is a um, CU Law alum. Uh, he and Allison Manea, his, his spouse, uh, their daughter made a snowman yesterday in Denver. And if you look carefully, you can see Flatirons. Uh, stocking cap, which feels really, really appropriate today. Uh, so thanks to, for uh, Travis for sending that along. Uh, really delight to have you here in person. Congratulations, you, you passed the test. Those of you who are here uh, and earned your State of Colorado travel badge to make it here, thanks for the special effort to scrape, slide, and find a way uh, to get here today. Also want to uh, welcome everyone who's joining uh, virtually. Terrific to have you with us. My name is Brad Bernthal. I serve as executive director here at the Silicon Flatiron Center. Uh, it's great to see so many old friends uh, back here again, and we look forward to making some new friends as well. Uh, how many of you have been to the flagship conference here in Boulder before? Veterans return. How many of you are here for the first time? All right, fantastic. Welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm going to do three things before I introduce uh, Dean Buckner Innes. Uh, first, I'm going to say a few words about why today and tomorrow's discussion matters. Second, talk a little bit about silicon flatirons. And third, I will explain how today will proceed. First, why does this discussion matter? There's a really interesting thing that I've noticed um, where the traditional strengths of silicon flat irons, and here I'm talking about the historic strengths at what we might call the bottom of the technology stack, physical infrastructure, spectrum issues, competition issues, are converging with some issues that are higher in the stack, privacy, network security, and among others, a host of issues around artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, collectively, these issues have pressing implications for trust in society, for innovation, and for key civic institutions. There's also a unique overlay to this highlighted by our conference's discussion, and that is that geopolitical fractures associated with trends like anti-globalization and strained international relations are in many ways pressing down into technology policy. In short, we have a world of mostly interconnected communications networks, and yet cooperation on policy solutions is increasingly difficult. I took over six months ago as the executive director here at Silicon Flatirons, but I've been around uh, Silicon Flatirons since 2005, and today's topics feel about as important as I've seen over the years. It's an exciting moment, but the stakes also feel higher. When this conference works, it helps all of us see around the next corner. And we very much look forward to conversations today and tomorrow that will help us all see the possibilities ahead. Second, a few words about Silicon Flatirons. We operate within the triangle of technology, law and regulation, and entrepreneurship and innovation, and there are three central commitments to how we operate. First, we believe at Silicon Flatirons that the most meaningful discussions need to have multiple stakeholders literally at the table. We'll have government policymakers shoulder to shoulder with academics, shoulder to shoulder with voices from private industry, shoulder to shoulder with voices from public interest organizations. That's commitment number one. Commitment number two for us is that technology policy making is a cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary enterprise. We need technologists at the table. We need business people and executives. We need lawyers. Definitely we need lawyers. Uh, we need economists. We need social scientists. And I hope that this conference lineup will reflect that as well. Our third commitment is that we should do a fantastic job of training the next generation of technology policy and innovation experts. And we emphasize here at Colorado Law to our students that government does not work on autopilot. We need great people, we need smart inputs in order to get good results 
and technology policy. And you will see our students at the center of things throughout the conference. Uh, for those of you who are joining from off campus, I strongly encourage you to seek out students, uh, offer them advice, offer them internships, and give them jobs, among other things. They will be visible throughout. Uh, the dean, in her remarks, is going to highlight some of my faculty colleagues uh, here momentarily. So I want to recognize two groups that are also linchpins in making Silicon Flatirons uh, a success. The first is our Silicon Flatirons team, which I'm going to expand out a little bit. First, a shout out to our student volunteers. Uh, these very odd individuals woke up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday, drove to campus, out shoveling the yard, out pouring down the, the salt. A round of applause for them. Uh, in a previous job, I was a tennis professional. I said, there's two kinds of people that I hire. There's those that'll go pick up the trash and those that'll look at it and say, that's not my job. I always wanted to hire those that'll pick up the trash. Our students, that kind of hustle shows up again, hire them. Uh, additionally, um, beyond the formal Silicon Flatiron staff, uh, as all of you know, it was not easy to get here. Uh, we have um, two teams, one from Third Harmonics, who's doing the IT staging and lighting, as well as a team from Greenpoint Catering. Uh, they did not have the easiest job to move staging and catering stuff in the snow and ice. Please help me take a, a moment to thank you guys. This is great for you guys to do it. Thank you. And of course, um, our Silicon Flatirons team is, uh, it, it, it is truly a privilege to work with this group. And I want to highlight them individually. First is our managing director, Nate Mariotti. Second, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to hold, we want to recognize my hold our applause for a second. Uh, Nate Mariotti, uh, our events director, uh, whom I've been in very close coordination with over the last 24 hours. Shannon Sturgeon has done a fabulous job. Uh, our program coordinator for our guests from out of town who are speakers. Uh, you have been in close collaboration with Christine McCloskey. Uh, and um, you will not find a better advocate for our students here at Colorado Law than our director of student programs, Sarah Schnickren. Um, Gabrielle Daly is a fellow who's leading our broadband initiative. Um, and it wouldn't be a Silicon Flatirons conference unless we make time to embarrass Dale Hatfield. Uh, Dale is uh, our co-director of the Spectrum Initiative. Um, and it's fair to say, uh, Dale is the true north of Silicon Flatirons, someone who is relentlessly intellectually curious, someone who weighs multiple perspectives, someone who really believes that multiple disciplines need to inform good technology policymaking, and someone with friends on all sides of the issue and the aisle. Uh, please help me thank all the Silicon Flatirons team. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, on the Silicon Flatiron side, I, I wanna say a word about our supporters who make this possible. Um, I am especially grateful uh, six months in, at least this is the case right now, I, I might, might change my tune down the road, but uh, our supporters really value the importance of thoughtful, principled technology policy discussions. They get behind Silicon Flatirons to make this possible, but they respect boundaries, which makes it very easy for us to conduct an intellectually honest center where we don't start at a certain answer, where we try to find the better answers. Please help me give a warm thank you to the Silicon Flatter and sponsors. Thank you. <laughs> Third, how will today proceed? First, um, if you are looking for relief, the bathrooms are down the hall. Just go down to the east and they're at the end of the hallway. Second, uh, at the beginning of each of today's segments, you'll see a student from Colorado who will handle the event or the, the section introduction. Um, after today's welcome, we're going to proceed as follows. First, we have a competition uh, panel, then uh, the great debate, uh, followed by a fireside chat with Commissioner Gomez. Then we'll break for lunch. As we come back, we've got the global fractures panel followed by an artificial intelligence and regulation panel. And then we'll close out today with a fireside chat with Assistant Secretary Alan Davidson. Um, after each section, we will have Q&A 
Um, we have what's uh, affectionately called the WISA rule, where our first question will go to a student, and we are in the law school, so Socratic method is possible if no one jumps on that, students. Um, and then we'll have a question in the room. And then for those of you who are joining uh, via remote, please send your question via uh, the, the chat function, and we'll have a, a virtual uh, question along the way. Um, we have a tradition before I introduce the dean. Please find somebody in the room that you've ideally not met before today. Take two minutes, introduce yourself, and we'll get going momentarily. All right, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the Dean of Co uh, Colorado Law School, uh, Dean Lolita Buckner Innes. Uh, by way of background, she did her undergraduate work at Princeton University, a JD from UCLA, and an LLM with distinction, and a PhD in law from Osgoode Hall Law in York University in Canada. Uh, she is a distinguished scholar, was a professor of law at Cleveland State University. She then moved to SMU Law, where she was a professor of law and the Robert G. Story Distinguished Faculty Fellow. Uh, while at SMU, she also took on administrative roles, including serving as the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at SMU Dedman School of Law. Along the way, she has been a prolific author in addition to uh, numerous articles. Her work includes a prize-winning legal history book, called The Princeton Fugitive Slave, The Trials of James Collins Johnson. And she is also the co-author of a forthcoming book this year? Uh, this year. This year, uh, called Talking About Black Lives Matter and Me Too. Three years ago, Lolita came to Colorado Law as our dean. Dean Buckner Innes has notably led the largest faculty hiring process in the history of our law school. It's really an exciting time here at our school. And among her hires, we'll see whether this one works out, was to uh, bring me on as executive director here at Silicon Flatirons. Please help me welcome Dean Lolita Buckner Ennis. Thank you. thank you so much, Brad, for those very, very kind words. And thank you all for being here. Um, I think like so many of you, whether you are in the audience, a panelist, um, or one of the planners, I, I think we were all sitting on the edges of our seats uh, for the last uh, 12 to 24 hours, and we are all here. Thank you so much. Uh, before uh, I begin with a few remarks, um, I would like to just spend a few moments reminding us of who we are, who we have been, and where we are, uh, and so I want to start with our land acknowledgement. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado Law School is on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and you peoples. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now the state of Colorado, the University of Colorado, and Colorado Law School. It is my very, very great pleasure to welcome both our live and our online audience to Silicon Flatirons 2024 flagship conference. I know that a few moments ago, uh, we learned that several of you have been here before. You are no strangers to this event and some of you are new. I think though for both those who are new and those who are old, you will find that this is going to be a tremendous and memorable event. At this conference, we delve into the intricate landscape of technology, technology policy, and we do that against the backdrop of an increasingly fractured global environment. Many of you traveled long distances to join us today, and I thank you, especially given uh, the circumstances, for making this journey to be with us. I want to offer a special welcome to our distinguished guests serving in government service. Some of these guests are in the audience today or will join us over the course of the, course of the conference. Officials participating in the conference are Attorney General Phil Weiser, who many of you know. Phil, for many years, served as a faculty member and dean at our law school, and he founded, of course, Silicon Flatirons. And so I must say that as we go forward with the work of Silicon Flatiron Center, we do so trying to fill the very large steps of Phil, and it is always a pleasure to see him back here at Colorado Law. We're also very happy to welcome Anna Gomez, 
a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission and a former Silicon Flatirons advisory board member. We also welcome the Honorable Andy Hartman, District Judge, State of Colorado. Judge Hartman taught at Colorado Law for many years and also led our experiential program. We further welcome Alan Davidson, National Telecommunications and Information Administration Assistant Secretary. We welcome Jessica Zucker, Director of Online Safety and Policy at Ofcom, which as many of you know, is the United Kingdom Communications Regulatory Agency. We welcome Nathan Symington, a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. And we also welcome United States Senator and former Colorado Governor, John Hickenlooper. Our conference themed global fractures and technology policy critically examines the erosion of global cooperation and heightened geopolitical tensions and the challenges that arise from those two issues. In a world that is witnessing a retreat from globalization and a rise in contention, this event aims to explore the impact of these changes. The Global Fractures Conference agenda, while designed to navigate the complexities arising from diverse international and state regulatory approaches, is also very importantly designed to be accessible to our broad audience of academics, students, political leaders, policymakers, technological specialists, and perhaps most importantly, in terms of our broader community, the lay public. We are here speaking in a voice that we believe will be heard by all. The conference focusing on a rapidly evolving landscape of generative artificial intelligence. It looks at mounting concerns related to data privacy and scrutinizes the competitive conduct of well-established technology companies. As we navigate the intersection of technology and policy, our discussions aim to shed light on the multifaceted challenges and opportunities that arise in this dynamic and ever-changing global arena. And, and just a, a moment to say that, you know, even five years ago when we said dynamic, I think we mean something even differently than we do today. I mean, every day literally brings us uh, tremendous change. I am pleased that this conference, following the very high bar set by Attorney General Weiser, will be of local, national, and international significance. It is, in fact, emblematic of the work that Silicon and Flatirons does to not only serve the community and the world, but to, perhaps most important of all, help provide our students some of the best foundation in the nation for careers in technology policy, emerging company law, and entrepreneurship. And a word about those careers. Um, I hope that any of you who are uh, so positioned in the audience, whether live or virtual, will think of our students uh, when you have opportunities for employment. Besides our wonderful students, Colorado Law is fortunate to have many highly accomplished faculty members, some of whom are experts in technology law and policy. One of them, Professor Margo Kaminsky, is on sabbatical. You will, however, hear from others in the coming days, including Professor Vivek Krishnamurthy, who joined us at Colorado Law this year, and we are so very, very delighted to have him. Professor Krishnamurthy specializes in human rights related challenges that arise in cyberspace. We also have Professor Harry Surden, whom many of you know. Harry is a leading scholar in artificial intelligence and the law. You will also see and hear from Professor Blake Reed, who is a leading voice on carriage of speech on technology platforms, a topic that will be front and center in the upcoming Net Choice case before the United States Supreme Court. And we have Professor Brad Bernthal, of course. Brad took over, as you know, as the full-time executive director last June. Brad, I wanna wish you great luck with this conference, but I, you know what, I think 
Having seen your work, luck has absolutely nothing to do with it. I'll say good luck anyway. And you know, finally, I want to give a special shout out to former Colorado law professor Paul Ohm, who's now at Georgetown. Um, and just want to say, Paul, once you're ours, you're ours forever. <laughs> so, uh, sup, Paul? Good to see you. This conference convenes at an important set, uh, at an important time, and it offers an important set of conversations. Um, just to share a few. One question is, how should we regulate or not? artificial intelligence. And I have to say that this is a question that, especially when I go out into the community, uh, especially the lay community, I'm asked all the time, why do we need lawyers? We have AI. <laughs> well, I, 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 it would probably take me a day to answer that. Um, I think one of the things I would say in response to that question and more broadly is that artificial intelligence, whether or not we regulate it, it remains a tool. I'm also reminded of the fact that as my grandmother, um, who was born not long after the beginning of the 20th century, used to say, when she was a little girl, people were afraid that they had moved away from chalk slates to using actual chalkboards. Um, and it was a really big deal to her mother that she didn't have to bring her little slate home. So, and, and so technology, obviously, and the need to regulate it and control it, that conversation obviously has evolved over time. But I think, in large measure, it's the same conversation that's gotten a lot more nuanced and a lot more detailed. And the bottom line is, if I say, who's afraid of a chalkboard, most of you will say, no, I think we have to get to the same place when we talk about artificial uh, intelligence. How can we manage the threats associated with misinformation and deep fakes? And I think that question, of course, will become one of uh, increasing importance as we move into this election year. And what happens when states step into the breach when Congress does not act on pressing matters of technology policy? That, too, is something that goes well beyond the conversation about technology law and policy. However, this conversation can, I think, be a helpful model for answering that question in a number of areas. These questions are challenging for any person or entity to address and certainly go well beyond the role of government. That is one reason we are here. The government, they lead us, they partner with us, but ultimately we are here, we, the policymakers, the academics, the students, the members of the public, we are here to help shape, guide, and ultimately send these issues forward in ways that are meaningful for us in our daily life. I want to, once again, thank you for being here and joining us on this immense journey of, explanation, of uh, exploration and explanation. Thank you so very much.